The Rock and Roll and Coffee Show is brought to you by Writers and Rockers Coffee Company, keeping the music and memories alive with some damn good coffee. Be sure to pick up your Rock and Roll and Coffee Show coffee only at writersandrockerscoffee.com. And also brought to you by Retroactive, located at Broadway at the Beach in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, keeping you retro with everything from 70s, 80s, and 90s. Shopretroactive.com. It's the Rock and Roll and Coffee Show. Yeah, we do. My next guest is Brian Thompson. Brian is an actor who played a small role in the Terminator movie alongside Arnold Schwarzenegger. He also played the Night Slasher in the 1986 film with Sylvester Stallone called Cobra. He has also been on X-Files, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and more. I talked to Brian about all this, how he got started in acting, next on the Rock and Roll and Coffee Show. It's the Rock and Roll and Coffee Show. Yeah, we do. Have you always wanted to be an actor? No, the the door opened when I asked my buddy Paul Delashaw in high school if he wanted to ride home. His house was on the way to my house, and I often gave him a ride because our lockers were near each other. And uh, he said, no, I'm trying out for the school play. Brian, there's a part you'd be great for. Oh, come on, Paul. I haven't, I don't, you know, I've never done any acting. Oh, Brian, it's a Russian ballet instructor. You look, you could be a Russian. Like, well, really? Anyway, I tried out for the play and got the part of the Russian ballet instructor in a play called You Can't Take It With You, a Coffin and Heart comedy. And that really, you know, lit the embers. The embers lit me. You know, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I, uh, I, it was a, the play was a smashing success. And I liked it more than anything I had done. I had been a successful football player and, a, you know, a, a li- maybe a little better than average swimmer. And the play was, the play's the thing. And uh, I got to college. I played football at Central Washington University. And then first quarter of the winter trimester, there was a play notice for Guys and Dolls that said, if you didn't have a sing a song, you could sing Happy Birthday. And I was there that night in the theater singing happy birthday <laughs> can you sing or or no can i sing yeah enough that i could do college productions and get hired you know in regional equity theater uh, i did i got my equity card and did two equity musicals i did i played the king and the king and i and did uh, a noel coward musical uh, called bittersweet and then, and then I started auditioning for film and television, and it pay, it paid better. <laughs> sure, sure. So back a little bit to this first one, this ballet teacher. Did you know anything about ballet? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. And I'll... and for, unfortunately, that that part of the he's an in home ballet instructor who's teaching the daughter of the wealthy family. Uh, how and we just i just had to teach you know it's like i don't what yeah. two two ballet moves okay so that was you know raise your arm i remember i remember holding my arms above my head <laughs> i don't i didn't know if you had a ballet background or not <laughs> no uh so you know to to catch up on the you know how i went from central washington university to you know getting my first job in hollywood the uh, I was a I was a music major. I really wanted to play the piano, but I right away realized that there was other people who could play the piano a lot better than I could. And my father pushed me to major in business because Central Washington had a very uh, 
well-respected business school. So I switched from business, from, from music to business, but I wouldn't leave the drama department alone. I, I really was a drama major. Uh, I got average grades in business school. And part of that reason was because a lot of, uh, a lot of people had already been in business. There were a lot of 30 and 40 something age students mm -hmm. whose, whose businesses had sent them to college. Gotcha. And those of us that were young, you know, the us in our late teens and early twenties, we we were kind of, I would, you know, to say ostracized is really that's that's a dramatic phrase, but we weren't in the same class as the kids that had ten a decade of working in a business. Sure, sure. We were completely, um, what just bumping into what what I mean, knowledge the, the the professor and these students these older students they would have these conversations and it was kind of like we weren't in the room because <laughs> we partially because we didn't understand them and I, I think partially because the professors really enjoyed their insight did you come from a performing family did anybody else in your family your mom or dad or any brothers or sisters uh, no, my mom had been a vocal major and had wanted to be a singer. Uh, you know, she was the choir director at our local church. Um, but it it was it was all very, you know, perfect tones and perfect right. vowels. Right. The perfect vowel frees and liberates the tone, <laughs> and very it was a very strident style of sting, singing. And no, no one, no one, and, uh, that was it. That my mom was the closest to being, having something to do with entertainment. Yeah. No one else. Not a, yeah, no. I asked because you said you were a music major and then into acting. So you seems like your your path was in some sort of entertainment performance. Yeah, my soul certainly was with music. I yeah. love I love playing the piano. I still play the piano, not as often as I should. Months go by with with the keyboard only collecting dust. But I, I'll go I'll go through seasons seasons where it attracts my attention. And I I I wrote a few songs that I can still play, roughly. Uh, that fun. was, but there were gosh. I was not a gifted piano player, not like some of the, I mean, there was one kid at school, I've told this story before, he was probably the reason I quickly gave up playing the piano, because he was, we were the same age, and I knew that if I practiced, you know, eight hours a day for the next four years, I wouldn't be as good as he was as a freshman. Yeah, some people just have, have it. He, yeah, it was. I mean, people like me, people would stop to watch him practice. It was a festival of music. And and he has made a living as at a piano bar in Seattle. Oh, wow. So, you know, I don't know if he tried to go on tour or or if, if he ended up writing his own music, but he's a, you know, he's the piano man very much like Billy Joel in his early career. You ever go see him? Um, I wanted to go see him to surprise him uh, when I was in Seattle a couple of years ago. And there was some issue with COVID and testing and vaccination. And I don't know if he if he returned back to the piano bar or not. Uh, that was two that was twenty twenty. It would have been twenty twenty one. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to. <laughs> we think he'd remember you. I'd find out if I walked in the bar, <laughs> wouldn't I? You would. we haven't, we, you know, we haven't seen each other since college, and that's been uh, almost forty years. So when you, so you got on your path to acting, and then you moved to California. Well, the transition was made a little easier by, well, by uh, by actually by. Uh, I worked for a, a coast marine construction company 
And they had offered me a job when I got out of school for starting at $50,000 a year. Cause I had, I, I had a knack for lining up jobs efficiently. Okay. And my boss, my foreman, after, you know, halfway through my first summer there, he started kind of, you know, consulting with me when we would move to a new location. And he, he would tell me how he was going to line up the job. And, and, and I would, you know, I just make suggestions about, well, if we did this, could we, would this be faster? Or, or, or once we got working on a job, um, I, I was able to come up with little ideas to line it up so that it was more efficient. And I think that's what got me the job offer. And so I had a job waiting for me when I got out of school I, and I was a senior and I was walking across campus and they were jackhammering the foundation of one of the campus buildings. And the, the percussive sound hit me in the stomach and I, my stomach literally just flopped. It like it like it went in a knot and I got cold sweats. I I went back to my dorm room and I, I had this. I had the, uh, the closest thing in my life, I think I've ever had to a panic attack. And it was this out loud discussion with myself where what's going on? Why did that? Ha why did that happen? Well, because you don't want to take that job. What do you want to do? You know what you want to do. You want to be an actor. Yeah, but I can't make a living as an actor. No, you can't make a living as an actor in Ellensburg. Well, how are you gonna how are you gonna make a living? Well, you gotta go where you get your job. Well, what about training? That's you know, that's the baby step towards any profession, right? Well, let's go do some training. Sure. So I wrote letters to the Screen Actors Guild and the Actors Equity Association asking if they recommended any schools. And to my disappointment, they didn't. Hmm. But they they both referenced a book called Acting Professionally by Dr. Robert Cohen. And I went to Central's library and they had it. It was there. A little paperback. And so I, I read I read that book and he recommended 10 schools, uh, one of which was his own, which was the University of California, Irvine. So I auditioned for uh, several professional actor training programs. And I I basically got a full ride to the University of California, Irvine. From I I I I last minute borrowed my parents' car. I, I grabbed a girl that was in a play with me and we drove to San Francisco and I I literally auditioned in the San Francisco Opera House. Um ne never having you know driven to San Francisco before. And uh a couple of weeks later, I got a letter, you know, waiving tuition and and giving me a teaching fellowship and, uh, you know, enough money to live on. And it was a three year program. So we I went to the University of California, Irvine in the fall. Uh, we act, sang, dance mostly seven days a week. Wow. So you got you got a practically full, full ride without any previous training, nothing. You just had that thing. Well, like to, to get bag. in the pro well to get in that those programs, you didn't need to have a bachelor's in drama. You needed to have a resume and and a degree to get an MFA. They just had to have a degree. The the a B a BA was not necessary, just a degree. And one of the other actors that got in that same year was a uh, was a literature major. He didn't have, uh, I, th I think everybody else had graduated a degree in drama. So that was, <laughs> that you know, that was my relief to find that out when I applied was that, oh, you don't have to have a, yeah, really? Fantastic. So, so it, it was just a fantastic program. It was, yeah. we, we had remarkable training and, and its proximity to Hollywood really was a catalyst to, um, transitioning from school to you know getting a job because I applied my business knowledge you know what was the barrier to me you know getting a job acting and it was 
surviving an audition because I knew at that point that most of my best auditions had been left at home because you got so nervous. You wanted it so badly. You would, I, I, the, the nerves would destroy the ability to, to be an artist. And so whenever I could, I started sneaking up to Hollywood to act, to audition. And, and I started doing that shortly after the start of my second year there. Uh, the second, the first summer after my first year, summer of 1982, I did the Colorado Shakespeare Festival in Boulder, Colorado. And I came back and I got that idea to start auditioning when I could. And within a couple of months, I started getting hired. Wow. Which, and some of the jobs I was able to actually do, I wasn't going to drop out of school, but some of them I was able to, you know, finagle just enough missed classes. And they had, uh, they had some professional credit for that allowed me to drop classes that I would miss, but still get a credit. There's a minimum number of credits you need to take per quarter to, you know, be a student in good standing. So we, we pulled it off and that's brilliant. And then halfway through my third year, that's when I, I'm skipping a little bit of important things. At the end of my second year, I got the job playing the evil villain Taurus Mordor in the Conan show at Universal Studios. It was called a sword and sorcery spectacular. So that put me in Hollywood for the summer with the job. And I used that time to send out pictures and resumes to agents. And I got a really fantastic agent who, like my first audition, I got a script and plane tickets to Spokane, Washington. And I was flown to Spokane, Washington, where I'm from, for the audition for a, a movie called Vision Quest. Oh, yeah. I remember that. that that's my first audition. Yeah. I didn't even have a side card. Just on my agent's recommendation, they flew me up there to meet the director. Wow. Yeah, they were a pretty big agency. And anyway, halfway through that school year, I got, uh, you know, I auditioned for this frizzy haired kid and this frizzy haired girl in a tiny little room for this movie nobody had ever heard of called The Terminator. And I did that job while I, while in college. You got the Terminator gig in college. In college, very first film. Wow. So when you went to that audition, you said it was a little room? It was a room barely barely big enough for a picnic table and Stonzi Stokes and Jim Cameron and Gail and her to sit behind the table and for me to stand in front of it. Is that how how are auditions usually? Is it small like it's that, usually a it little or... bigger room than that that's the yeah. smallest room that i believe i've ever had to audition in there was you know while you were auditioning you felt uncomfortably close yeah i'm sure <laughs> so when you walk into the audition what i mean how did that go did they give you the lines to read or i mean what what happens there was there was those it was the punk rocker scene uh, stanzi read the the other person's lines with me and I finished reading and Jim Cameron said, I believe it. Thank you. Huh. That was it. Did, it was pre I, I don't remember any <laughs> small talk. Did they tell you you got the gig or, or did they not yet? That almost never happens. No, they don't. The, tell the, you right the, yeah, never. That's like never happens because they got to negotiate with your agent. You know, in a job like this, it was just, you know, scale plus 10. Yeah. Once in my life, I've had an audition where the director grabbed me, pulled me out of the room and walked me into the producer's office and said, hire this guy. He's the best actor I've seen. One time. And I'm I'm kind of it was exciting to have that happen at the time, but I I honestly, as time went by, I wish he hadn't done it because 
you kind of always think, well, maybe that would happen again. <laughs> <laughs> it never did. Yeah, it's never <laughs> happened since. And okay. and I ended up working for that director on two other movies also. And he was David Beard. It was a, a very creative, creative soul. He he wrote. He's a writer director. Ran the White Fire Theater for many years in Studio City. So in so your audition for Terminator, did you know Arnold was in it? Did they tell you that stuff, or do you not know? At that time, I'm not positive that we knew that it was a Schwarzenegger picture. Okay. I can't say for certain if sure. I knew. I knew I knew shortly after I got the job that Arnold was in it, but I don't know if when I auditioned. I'm thinking I didn't know because as I'm as I'm looking back, being in that room, thinking about who I was reading to, I don't remember picturing, you know, this hulking, hulking, you know, cyborg. It wants to rip your insides out. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> So how about the first day or when you shot that scene? Was that a one day shoot or did, was it multiple days? Or? Oh, yeah, it's one day shoot for sure. And and something I haven't read anywhere for some reason. And, I, you know, if I see a Jim Cameron, I guess I'll have to ask him that. But we had we shot that scene and Jim wanted to reshoot it. There was something about the first time we shot it that that uh, he didn't. But he want, he, I think he wanted to improve on it. Maybe he didn't like the location. Maybe he didn't like my acting. Uh, but uh, we had to reshoot it. So like, like a month or more later, you know, I got a call saying, hey, we're going to reshoot the scene. And that led to a bit of a, a bit of drama at the school because I was in a play that I didn't, that I had a very small part in. And I found an actor who would said he would do the part for me. And the director wouldn't let me out of the play. You know, if you, if you uh, don't show up for a play, they'll kick you out of school. Jerk. There was total, total power play. Yeah. I was it. And I mean, it was, I, I've never seen more casting couch than what I've seen in college. And this was the eighties and it almost was the culture. If you weren't sleeping with one of your students, you weren't with it. Mm hmm um and anyway if it worked out though uh, well what happened was i uh i parked my car in the loading dock at the uh well my call time for the terminator was 8 p.m that was the curtain that's when the curtain went up on a three and a half hour shakespeare play coriolanus same time so at intermission i parked my car at the loading dock of the play the the director wouldn't even let me out of the curtain call because i wasn't on stage for like the last like 15 minutes of the play still wouldn't even let me out of the curtain call it's just a complete dick and so as soon as that curtain came down <laughs> i spit into my car because i thought well i don't i don't have a job you know it's so hard to get a job in any movie in hollywood I, so I, you know, what do I was 23 years old. I drove over a hundred miles an hour up I-5. And it was like, it's kind of, I, I, it's the only time in my life I drove that fast. But at a hundred miles an hour, it's like the other cars are sitting still and you're just going, you're just going through them almost as if they're stationary. I drove oh god it was stupid <laughs> so i go and, and the scene was up at griffith park so i'm you know past the greek theater through the windy road <laughs> Stand, you know just a standard transmission jet of gli yeah i'm gonna pull in there find somebody with a walkie-talkie hi i'm brian thompson i'm here i, I want to and i finally get to like the second second ad and then it's like oh brian i'm glad you're here oh no we're not gonna get to your scene for hours oh no and that's the you know that's the beauty of cell phones yeah you, you didn't know, have had, them back had, then had had i have been able to reach the set i would have had the second ad's phone number i could have called them and they'd have said brian oh yeah take your time so you know and i'm sure there's other instances like that you know cell phones i believe have saved people's lives because i believe that the fact that people know they have more time to get somewhere 
has allowed them to not drive like a stupid 23 year old kid who doesn't want to lose a part in a movie. Well, you got that part. And it, like I said, it was just a small part. Everyone that's seen it knows, you know, the beginning scene. I think there was three of you guys, right? Yeah. I confronted him. Yes. He, he walked up to us. He yeah. confronted us. We were he being nice it. to him. Yeah. He started it all. He he, he absolutely did. <laughs> It was his, it, he was the one. So after that, after you got that role, of course, you didn't know how big that movie was going to be. But what was your next role after that? What Did it happen after Terminator started taking off or before that came out? Well, there was a, that was the final, uh, final two quarters of my third year at Irvine. And in that I had I got five SAG jobs that year. There was I did a I did a commercial. I did a I did moonlighting, you know, with Bruce sure? Willis and yeah. Sybil uh -huh. I did the pilot. You did. And uh I got my SAG card playing in a movie called uh, no, a, a pilot called Street Hawk. It was, uh, you know, Nighthawk yeah. with David Hasselhoff was really a big show at the time. So they were they were doing a complete rip off with a motorcycle, mm. and it was called instead of calling it Nighthawk, it was called Streethawk. Okay, and I don't remember that. It only they only did like half a season. I don't know if they did a full okay. half season or not. And uh, the the audition was two words. What's that? Did you get the job? And well, <laughs> I, I, at the audition, the uh, I met the producer and the director, and they told me about the scene. And the direct the director, you're saying what's that to a blue ray beam that comes out of the Nighthawk motorcycle, and and immobilizes the car. And you know, I was it was another punk rocker part. Punk rockers were very popular in 1984, <laughs> yes, they were. and. Uh, so, so this blue ray beam the director was saying to me so the blue ray beam hits your your car and you say what's that and he goes yeah could you could you do it um acting and i said well i was being a little bit i was trying to be a little bit funny i said well would could you do the blue beam <laughs> well, obviously you can't right and he goes okay i'll do it and so the director um he uh he goes Okay, you ready? And somebody goes, and he goes, mm -hmm. and I go, what's that? <laughs> and uh, uh, like a day later, my agent calls and says, well, Brian, uh, they're offering you this job, but I forgot to tell them that you don't have a SAG card. I'm like, oh. He goes, I think the best plan here is to go Go to the casting director's office and see if you can like just get in a word with him. And back then, the casting director offices were outside the gates of Universal Studios, so you could kind of crash in there. And he told me to do this. He said, "Go there and see if you can just have a word with Bill Johnson, and just tell him you know you're in school and that um, you'd really like to get your side card." And See if they can take pity on you. And I did. I, I I hung out in the hallway and waited till I saw him come out of his office and I casually said hello and told him that I didn't have my side card and was hoping that that wouldn't be a problem. And he goes, Well, you got, he goes, you got a resume, you got you've got you know the credits to to become an actor. It's, it's not like the, the, he said the Screen Actors Guild gives us a hard time when, uh, you know, we're, we're just like pulling some schmo off the street that doesn't have any acting background. But I, I, I don't think it'll be a problem. But I'll, we'll have to talk it over with the producers. And uh, they said no problem. I'm like there you go. Yeah, I got my SAG card. <laughs> so I had, so I got my, I had my SAG card and full health benefits through the Screen Actors Guild by the time I got out of college. So is that when, when you got out of college, is that when you landed the Cobra role? 
That was a year later. Okay. I graduated in college in 84, June of 84, and August of 85, I got the part in Cobra. Okay, so that audition, what? how did that one work out? Did you know it was Sylvester Stallone? Oh, oh for sure. I know. Yeah. yeah, definitely it was Stallone. I read the, um, I, I wasn't given the whole script. You're just given, I was given that speech at the end, that scene, the confrontation scene, and was just completely mystified by it. You know, I mean, I read it and I read it and I read it. And it was, uh, Fortunately, not like any parts that I've ever had to play ever before that. Did you not and like I that just role? had what's that? Did you not like that role? No. 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 Yeah, you were great in that role. <laughs> um, I <laughs> liked getting the op I liked the opportunity of getting to have the job, but to portray somebody of that who, who's that off psychologically it's painful i mean to have that much hate to have enough hate that you want to kill somebody to have enough hate that you want to kill random people so when you're acting you take all that in right you become that that character well think about do, right well think about what you do you're doing you're in the environment that is everything that a psychopath would do except the original kernel of thought that put him there your body is experiencing the same thing all that blood is there the weapons there the victim is screaming in horror yeah you know if so if somebody really can do a part like that and then just and not have be given nightmares by it I don't think they're I don't think they've delved that deep into the human psyche to understand that type of of pain, hurt and and commitment, commitment to that evil behavior. Just fully committed. That's interesting you say that because I've, I've never thought about it that way as an actor would feel that. In that type of role. Well, think about think about getting in a car wreck. You've been in a bad car wreck, or a, a car wreck enough that it shook your bones and broke some skin, drew some blood. Yeah. Well, it stayed with you for a while, didn't it? Yeah, for a little bit. Yeah. So when you were in during the audition, did you think maybe this role isn't for you? Or were you just excited to get in this type of movie? I didn't have the thought that this part wasn't for me. I didn't have, you know, I didn't have the, I didn't have any kind of career ambitions or any thoughts to shape a career. You know, we had had actors come to school and, and I had read a lot about, you know, what other actors had written about just how absurdly hard it is just to get a job. Yeah. My my career ambition was, number one, to survive, which meant get a job acting. I, I was just, I was thrilled for the opportunity to, to be in a movie with the number one box office draw in the world. Yeah, he it, was huge at that time. Yeah, to, it would be the equivalent of, you know, being opposite Bradley Cooper right now mm -hmm. or, or or Brad Pitt or, you know, any of the yeah. mega, mega stars. And, and you know, Stallone still is a, a you know, but he is a, he is a workhorse. It, it's amazing. It's amazing what he keeps putting together that he keeps that he still wants to keep doing it but if you have a love for it though i guess that never goes away as long as you can do it yeah i would i would i would really love to see him have a pet project about 
something that he's really passionate about it and you know maybe maybe he really loves shooting bad guys you know where the good guy triumphs in the end i'm you know those movies were kind of fascinating to me or entertaining anyway and and now now any fight scenes i fast forward through them oh you do yeah, I like that. I'm if I'm watching it. Okay, who wins it? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> You're kind of like magicians who know how the mu- the magic act is done. There's no, we've done. I've done so many stage fights that I I I just uh, it's watching the fight. It doesn't hold any s- suspense. It's just it's just a plot point. Who wins? Okay, okay. He's got now. He's got a. Now, oh, now he's got to go through the next few days with the limp because he got his ankle tweaked. Um, okay, you know, with the story part of it, I, I, I wish, I wish that Netflix and Amazon allowed you to play your videos faster, like YouTube, <laughs> like YouTube, speed it up. I know, and it's a horrible thing to say. I can see a director's going to want to kill me for saying that. Yeah. But the, uh, you know that. Movies that are shot in Europe in PAL get sped up or do when they? they 5%. And you can't yeah. tell huh. because that's 25 frames. Yeah. So that t- they they blend that 25th frame into 24 frames. Wow. So I did not know that. Yeah. And you can't tell. Yeah. The uh, You can speed up almost any... It, about five percent and then you've got to lower the voice pitch just a smidge yeah that's a the all european movies are spread up that much so that means that you could do that with any american movies yeah. speed them up a little bit and if and louder faster funny or in a comedy it's a it's a rule to live by sometimes sometimes but it you know if you can get it if you can get the job done quicker you owe it to your audience to get it done quicker so let's go back to Cobra a little bit. Um, that role you played in that movie. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one. I'm sure you've heard it before, but you were a pretty scary character in there. Well, that guy is, the guy is, the guy was effed up, right? So that kind of role, like he didn't have, he had some talking parts in that film, but there wasn't a whole lot. It was more mannerisms i guess you would say you know and and facial expressions that that portrayed what you were trying to get across is that harder to do that kind of thing than a more speaking role i would say that no that that's much that's much easier is it okay. you know, yeah, because you you know when you're speaking part and not so much anymore but when they shot stuff with one camera or just two cameras you, know, you had to match everything that you did a lot of people don't understand a lot most people don't know about matching when you're talking and i'm scratching my nose when i say nose right here on take two and three you got to scratch your nose when you're or take a bite of food or turn to that person this way or they can't cut it together so the freedom of not having to match exactly your actions with words uh, is uh, allows you to just be in your imagination. So that's that's actually there's a freedom there, the freedom of not having to do as much matching. You still are required to match, but not it's not as regimented based on what you're how you're talking. You know, one thing I like that movie. I like Cobra. I was a, a Stallone fan, especially during that time with Rocky and Rambo. But, and, well, you said was. Does that mean it's past tense? Well, I, I was trying to think. You no, know, I still like him, of course. But I don't know his last movie that I've seen. I can't remember. Besides Cobra, I watched that not too long ago. But new movie? I don't know. What's a, what's a new movie he's got out? <laughs> See? You got it, too. <laughs> but anyway... Um, so working with working with him and on your first that was probably your first major role right for sure yeah so i mean how was it working with him well the 
you got to understand, you know, the context that he was operating in when we did Cobra. He was engaged to and married Brigitte Nielsen during filming. Oh, during filming, I get that. Yes. And Rocky IV was out. It was the number one movie in the country. So he's he's got so many things you know he's being prodded from all angles you know he's he, he was you know didn't have time to really concentrate say just on the movie mm. and it was, it was my first look into seeing how much you know, some of these stars are not as committed to the acting craft, the acting craft part of it, as the as the filmmaking part of it. Maybe that's because he understood what the minimal amount that needed to be done to get the the bits and pieces that come together out of sequence and and make a story. Like I I tried. I tried to get some justification for the group of men that I was leaving, leading. Yeah. Really and really anything there. And the conversation fell on deaf ears. It didn't, it wasn't, didn't seem important to Sly. It didn't seem important to Cosmatos. And it certainly wasn't important to the producer, James Brubaker. That was really disappointing. Sure. A little let down. You know, you would have made a good uh, opponent in a Rocky movie. <laughs> for and him. well, and maybe you know, maybe that's kind of why I got cast. You know, he had just he had just cast Dolph Lundgren, and Dolph and I have uh, been to auditions for the same parts. Uh, but, you know, we're both probably you know Western European looking, you know, angular features taller slightly taller than average yeah how tall are you a six two okay you're a pretty big guy <laughs> does well, that does you does your build and and your body type does that limit you in acting to certain roles like p people see you and say well he needs to be this kind of role or has it has it kept you from getting roles that you really wanted not that i know of um, most, uh, be, I think, you know, maybe initially in those early years, you know, there was, uh, there was sort of a more stereotypical casting going on in the eighties and nineties, but now, you know, the, the world is so much more homogenized, you know, anybody can do anything. You know, it doesn't, your body type doesn't mean that you can't be a doctor. You know, it might, it, maybe you can't be, uh, a fighter pilot because there are size limitations on astronauts and fighter pilots um or or or, or jockeys <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that um be. but golly you know there i you know the world is really opened up in that respect i i i see all types of you know almost all the parts i audition for anymore say open to any ethnicity you never saw that in the 80s if you had if you were of an ethnicity it typically was a story point there's a reason he's a russian you know there's a reason he's a german there's a reason he's from uh you know asia somewhere or and that's it doesn't matter anymore which is which is a a, a very nice nice part but the you know the other side of that is that you know there's more actors from all over the world you know really good actors that are you know can play those that you're up against i haven't had an audition for a dialect role i don't know if i had an audition for you know needs a german accent i don't they can just there's hundreds of german actors in hollywood they can cast from yeah the yeah. real german accents right so when you get a role what what attracts you to the script i mean what attracts you to a role well 
you know, in those early years, it was the fact that they actually had, they could pay you. Seriously, you don't, you know, you've, you've got kids, they got to go to school. Uh, what attracts me now is the story. And is it a story that might have a chance of standing the test of time? Uh, um, I, you know, it took me 36 years to get an audition for, you know, the Coen brothers to get in, to get in the room. And, and you know, so I, I, I got a couple scenes with uh, Denzel Washington and Macbeth. That's, um, <laughs> I think that story is going to stand the test of time. Yes. And I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there as a, <laughs> as a wild assumption. Have you watched the, uh, you know, I, this year I put up 40 characters in 40 minutes on YouTube. On your YouTube? Mm -hmm. I don't I don't think I saw, saw that. And so I'm looking for a part that can be added to that. That's, that's 40 different characters. And you would be troubled to... I tried to give them all a different engine, all a different modality. Um, you know, obviously they all have my body, but their thought processes and what they want out of their life, all 40 of those guys are completely different. Do you have a favorite type of role you like to do? My favorite type of role I like to do. Wow. You know, I don't, I don't know if I've been asked that question before. So the answer is no. I like, I like to. I like to be part of a good story. As long as the story is good, you're you're good. With yeah, it. I like to be part of a good story, and and I don't, you know, I don't have to have the showy part. It's nice if it's something that uh, uh, there's some meat in, you know, that you get you get your time carrying the ball, uh, or or they'll let you do something, some some you know creative choices of your own. That's always fun. You know, that you're not getting shoved into a box that might be similar to what you've done before. All right, Brian. Well, listen, man, I appreciate you taking the time. I know it's late. Um, thanks again, bud. Uh, my pleasure. And uh, we can, uh, if you've got more questions, we could add to it in the future if you want. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'd love to have you back on. You okay. got any, you got anything coming up in the future here soon? Uh, just that, you know, Macbeth was released on Apple TV and yep, I want to check that out. And then whenever they go back in time on 911, uh, Angela Bassett show. Okay. I'm the older gruffer captain of the same firehouse. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, we'll get you back on. We'll talk about, you got a lot more movies out there that we can get into. Um, we'll, we'll have you back on. Okay. Thanks buddy. We'll see you. Night.